Alex is preparing. So it's setting it up. Okay. We're ready. Okay. <clears throat> Welcome to, sister, this is not my, okay. I'm gonna go on the count, I'm gonna go here. Ready. Welcome to Sister Reach's monthly social Justice Preachers Series. I'm Dr. Sylvia Rue, Education and Harm Reduction Director for Sister Reach. Sister Reach is a grassroots 501c3 nonprofit organization founded by Sharice Scott in 2011 in Memphis, Tennessee. Sister Reach supports the reproductive autonomy of women and teens of color, poor and rural women, LGBTQ plus people, and their families. <clears throat> through the framework of reproductive justice. Sister Reach's mission is to empower our base to lead healthy lives, raise healthy families, and live in healthy and sustainable communities. This is achieved through working by a four-pronged strategy, education, policy and advocacy, cultural shift and harm education on local, national, and international levels. Which brings us to today's speaker, Reverend Cheryl Ward. The topic is the Black Church and Sexuality. Now, this year, Reverend Cheryl Denise Ward will celebrate 44 years in ministry. Her sermons have been published in the African American Pulpit, Preaching Journal, the Women of Color Study Bible, <clears throat> and Those Preaching Women. She has served as the founding pastor of one church in Oakland, California, and as the interim pastor of several churches over the last two decades. She holds a Master of Arts degree in homiletics from Pacific School of Religion at the Graduate Theological Union in Berkeley, California, and is completing a Doctor of Philosophy degree in psychology. Her dissertation is focus is Black women and the psychology of sexuality slash relationships through the examination of Black female protagonists in fiction. Reverend Ward serves as a guest speaker at various churches, conferences, and women's symposiums, and is known for her inspiring and empowering sermons. Her candor and ability to speak openly on issues has made her a highly sought after speaker across denominational gender and generational lines. <clears throat> her Cheryl Ward Ministries employs over a dozen young people who, who distribute COVID-19 information, testing, and vaccines. Her primary focus is reaching young men and women who have been involved in or are at risk being involved in street violence and human trafficking. I give you Reverend Cheryl Denise War. Thank you, Dr. War, for joining us today on the Preacher Series. Thank you. I am deeply grateful to Sister Reach for this opportunity uh, to speak and to be among that great sorority of sisters, sister preachers who have gone before me as well as those who are to come. I'm grateful to be able to participate and present on this esteemed platform filled with powerful preaching women. I give honor to the board and staff of Sister Reach, to the executive director, to Dr. Rue, and thank you for allowing me to be with you today. It's our pleasure. I wanna talk from the title, Can We Talk? The Black Church and Sexuality. Over 20 years ago, I preached a sermon at First AME Church in Los Angeles 
entitled, You Don't Live on My Street, which came from a poem of that same name by Dr. Rivera Elliott Faustin. That sermon was well received and played over the radio airwaves in the Los Angeles area for several years. And I think one of the reasons why people lauded that message was because I talked about the judgment that takes place in the church around sex and sexuality. The issue is not or was not necessarily sex itself, but it was the judgment. Uh, and generally when you mention uh, the church and sexuality, people only think about homosexuality. Dr. Kelly Brown Douglas says, we cannot talk about homosexuality because we can't talk about sexuality. Can we talk? When I speak of the black church, it is a universal term that includes various black denominations like AME, CME, AME Zion, National Baptist, Progressive National Baptist, Church of God in Christ, Apostolic, as well as non-denominational churches with different theologies and different belief systems. In 2003 on Tavis Smiley's State of the Black Church, Dr. James Cone said, we need a thinking church. Jesus told us to love God with our heart, soul, and mind. Theology is loving God with your mind. Theology is your belief system. And you do that with your mind. Cone said, if we could get the collection of us, like on this stage, like was on that stage on, on uh, Tavis's show, if we could get them together where they're in a closed circle room and get our minds together and we learn from each other, he says, I think we would begin to make our way towards a solution to some of our issues. And that's what I wanna say today. Let's talk. Most of what I learned about sex, I learned in the church. <laughs> I wish I had an audience so I could say amen somebody. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> I learned in conversations in the youth choir. At 14, I learned <laughs> to run from the 40 year old deacon who was trying to do more than pray with me. Amen. Yeah. I learned from watching the women chasing after the newly hired organist. But I can honestly tell you that as much as the church preached against sex outside of marriage, against homosexuality, against underage sex and everything else, honey, it was going on and is still going on in the church. And can I say this, clutch your pearls now, church people are having sex. My, 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 <laughs> and they're having sex with each other and with other people and with folks they probably shouldn't be having sex with. And all of them aren't married that exists today, that existed back then. As much as we want to view things through stained glass denial, it is past time for us to sit down and talk openly and honestly about sex and sexuality as it pertains to the black church. We must have this conversation because the church has been dishonest and in some cases disingenuous around this subject. Our preaching and teaching has caused injury to so many people to the point that they won't even step foot in a church anymore. The injuries have been caused by the judgment and church wounds are the hardest from which to recover. 
I like that. Can I say that again? Church wounds are the hardest from which to recover. The reason being is because the injury took place in the last place you expected it to happen. God called us to love and not to judge. But the church specializes in cancel culture, especially when it comes to sex. It is past time for us to learn to deal with an issue without ostracizing an individual. Let me say it again. It is past time for us to learn to deal with an issue without ostracizing the individual. I like that. I'm going to say it one more time. It is past time for us to learn to deal with an issue without ostracizing the individual. Mm -hmm. Those who get caught get ostracized and belittled. In some cases, they still have you come before the church and embarrass you. I mean, confess to the people. Jesus said, with loving kindness have I drawn thee. Christian cancel culture means we label you as a fornicator, as an adulterer, as a homosexual, then don't want anything else to do with you. Yet the church has double standards because if the offender is one of the biggest tithers or is the pastor, and mostly if they are male, then it gets swept under the rug. It is very similar to the biblical story of the woman who was caught in adultery. The people bring her to Jesus asking how they should punish her. There is no mention of the male offender, his name, his status, or where he is. They only bring the woman to Jesus. The text says Jesus took a stick and wrote some words on the ground. The text does not tell us what it said, but we can use our sanctified imaginations and imagine that Jesus took that stick and wrote down the name of everybody who was accusing her and everybody that they were fooling around with. John with Susie, Chris with Karen, David with Gerald. When he busted them out, they all left the scene and left that woman there. And Jesus said, go thy way and sin no more. So it is here that we come back to the question, can we talk? We need to talk. In her book, Eloquent Rage, author Brittany Cooper tells the story of one of her visits to the country in Southern Louisiana to visit her grandmother when she was 22 years old and her grandmother told her it was time for her to start having sex. Can you all imagine your grandmother telling you something like that? <laughs> Cooper said, I was steeped in all kinds of Christian guilt about the little bit of sex that I had had and copious amounts of vibrating I had done. Most times I was in a sanctified denial about my desire to be sexual in the first place. Let's say that again. She says, most times I was in a sanctified denial about my desire to be sexual in the first place. Cooper was shocked to hear her grandmother advise her in such a manner. Then her grandmother continued by confessing that she and her contemporaries were having sex when they were Cooper's age. She told her nobody knew, but they were certainly doing it. Now, this is very different from the advice of most grandmothers because usually Big Mama and them told the boys to keep their pants zipped and told the girls to keep their dresses down. Somebody knows what I'm talking about. It is here that Cooper says she came to understand some things. And it is here that I'm hoping that we will come to at least dialogue about and come to some understanding of, of some things. Can we talk? In her book, Sexuality and the Black Church, Dr. Kelly Brown Douglas says, 
the black community must initiate a comprehensive form of sexual discourse if it is to repel and disrupt the power of white culture concerning black bodies, sensuality, and spirituality. This discourse can be seen as a sexual discourse of resistance. As such, it would expose the oppressive sexual politics of white culture while fostering positive life-affirming understandings of black sexuality. Let me say that part again. As such, it would expose the oppressive sexual politics of white culture while fostering positive life-affirming understandings of black sexuality, i.e. the reversal of Roe versus Wade. The same system who wants to legislate what a woman can and cannot do with her body. Any way you look at it, this system is the same system that said it was legal for us to be enslaved. This system is the same system that passed a law saying it was illegal for us to learn to read and write. This system is the same system that said it was illegal for us to marry. Biblically, it's the same sexist, oppressive politics that caught the woman in the act of adultery, but not the man. It is the same politics that creates a don't ask, don't tell within the four walls of the black church where we want our same gender loving brothers and sisters to live closeted lives, especially our musicians. Amen. Amen. If we told the truth about it, there would be very little music, very few songs to sing if it weren't for our L L LGBT brothers and sisters. Can we talk? It's spiritual abuse to force someone to live in a closet. Mr. Bivette Flunder says, closets were not made for people. Fresh air doesn't circulate. It breeds dust and other airborne things that keep us from catching our breath. We cram things into closets. We keep old unused items in the closet, things we never use, beautiful things we should be wearing. A big part of the issue is we hate that which we do not understand. Preach, Cheryl Ward. We hate that which we do not understand, so we call it wrong. We say it is unjust. Let's just tell it like it is. Can we talk? Let's talk. We can sit and debate scripture all day and go back and forth quoting scriptures in support and disagreement. We like to use Leviticus to condemn our gay brothers and sisters, but if we're gonna use that text, we have to also add the part that applies to us. Like we have to figure out what we're gonna do with our fine clothes. I got to take this off because you can't wear your wool suits and your dresses and your Sunday at Sunday best because it was against the law to wear mixed linen. And you can forget eating catfish. Come on, black people on Friday. You can't eat any more crab. You can't eat any more sh shrimp. Am I bowling down your alley yet? Women, we can't flaunt our hair, our wigs, our weaves because we have to cover our heads. And let me say this, you can't cut your hair. Oh, come on somebody. Brothers, you can't trim your beard. You know, it's the beard culture. Now, you can't trim your beards. And don't even think about being in the same house with your wife when she's on her cycles. Sisters, we can't be around anybody during that time of the month. If we're going to go there, then we have to go all the way there. For all of you dog lovers, you cannot mix breed your animals. God bless our little multi poos because there's no more of that. Come on, somebody. They either got to be a Maltese or they ought to, or, or they got to be a poodle. No rare or medium well steaks. There can't be any blood anywhere in your food. Come on, somebody. No sushi, no tattoos. There goes the NBA. 
Amen. No divorce, no remarriage. Shall I keep going? If we're going to live by the law, then we have to apply all of the law. You can't pick and choose. Can we talk? We need to talk. Even if we disagree, we ought to still be able to talk. We ought to still be able to get along and be open to agree to disagree. It's our lack of discussion that inadvertently causes our children to repeat the same closeted behavior that we have. It's our quietness and our lack of talking and our lack of discourse that causes our children to stay on Tinder and all of these other dating apps looking for casual hookups, not looking for any type of connections. Girls are, and, and boys are dishonest and they're silent and they're secretive. Girls are looking to have more casual sex. Uh, it's a form of taking back their power. They are being careless and reckless. They are more dis desensitized, to desensitized to true connections and more interested in gratification. Amen, somebody. Our young adults are no longer getting married. You all notice that? Your kids ain't getting married no more. They're just moving in together. They go out a few times, they move in together. And sometimes they move into their mama's house. Come on, somebody. And if they decide to have a wedding later on down the road, they get married and the kids are in the wedding. I, I, I can't tell you how many little kids have said to me, my mama and daddy getting married and I'm going to be a flower girl. Come on, somebody. We have not taught them to learn that sexuality has so much more to do with intercourse, that it has to do with passion, it has to do with personality. It has to do with connection. We haven't taught them to learn the difference in the way we relate to one another. Let's talk about the things that are common to men and common to women. The difference between men and women. Women want love, men want sex, amen. Sometimes we as women get the two mixed up. We need to teach them that there is a certain discipline around celibacy. Teaching young people to wait until you are ready, until you are with someone who loves you and can respect you. Come on, somebody. Not just a casual hookup for the sake of hooking up and then turning around and hooking up with somebody else and then turning around and hooking up with your friend's ex. I'm talking to somebody here today. You all understand that what we are doing, closeted, is turning out to be an open face thing that the kids are doing and not thinking anything about it. Can we talk? Things have changed. We got to talk. We got to teach our young people to find out before you shack up with somebody. Find out before you marry somebody, what is their FICO score? Do they have long and short-term goals? Are they neat or messy? Can they cook? Do they take care of their health? You got to find out what kind of childhood trauma took place in their life because it's going to show up in your marriage. Amen, somebody. You have to get up out of bed and talk sometime. Sex ain't everything. We can't just tell them not to do it and leave it at that. And that's what the church has been doing. Things have changed and we have to learn how to evolve with them. If we don't, then they will learn from TikTok and Instagram and all of the other uh, social media platforms. They will learn from their peers who know less than they do. Can we talk? Maybe we don't need to change our theology or our belief system in some cases, but we need to change our approach. Maybe we do need to change our beliefs though. Maybe what we've been doing is quoting scripture out of context. Maybe it was a misinterpretation in the first place. Maybe it wasn't even scripture. Maybe it was tradition, something that was passed down from generation to generation. And that's what we've been believing all the time. Maybe we are right, maybe, and we need to just quit beating people over the head. 
Amen, somebody. Let me say that again. Maybe we are right and we just need to quit beating people over the head. Maybe we just need to love them. Maybe that's the case. Can we talk? We better start talking because HIV and AIDS is still real. It's the preacher, it's the deacon, it's me, oh Lord, who's turning up HIV positive. I'm in the church, but I have an STD. I'm singing, but I have something I can't get rid of. I'm preaching, but me and Mrs. Jones, me and Mr. Jones got something going on. Let's talk. Can we talk? Maybe we're speaking the same language and the difference is just semantics. I'm preaching in here on this Facebook Live today. Let's talk. Can we talk? It's time to stop being divided over our differences. It's time to stop being separated by our belief system. It's time for us to put our grown up pants on, sit down, love and grow together. Let's talk, but let's not stay there too long. Let's move past our differences and focus on our calling, which according to the Lord Jesus Christ is to do justice, to love mercy and to walk humbly before our God. Can we talk? Let's talk. According to Jesus, the spirit of the Lord is upon us, for he has anointed us to proclaim good news to the poor. He didn't call us to fight over what we believe about sex and sexuality. He has anointed us to preach good news to the poor. He has sent us to proclaim freedom to prisoners and recovery of sight to the blind and to set the oppressed free. Can we talk? Let's talk. This, my friends, is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. I want to ask you a few questions, okay? Yes. So you mentioned being at um, Elder Cecil Chip Murray's church, First AME Church in Los Angeles and preaching? Yes. I was in the audience, I had just joined his church, and that was the first sermon I ever heard that was pro-LGBT, and it kind of blew my mind, and that's why I really loved going to that church, because that was, it was well-received, and it was amazing, and you and I have been working with uh, Black church folk for, what, 30, 40 years, mm -hmm. and I've said that the church has AIDS, and I don't mean acquired immune deficiency syndrome. I mean, absolutely ignorant about the divinity of sex. So I was talking to a minister once and he I like said, that. Yeah, <laughs> he said that um, he said because it was it was a talk about sexuality. And he said, well, you know, our problem is that the Bible is black and white on sex and you're talking about the gray and we can't deal with the gray. And that's the problem because the world, the life, life is not in black and white, but it's in gray and all the colors of the rainbow. And so he was saying, without really understanding that he was admitting that the church was not able to deal with the realities of human sexuality in all of its glory and all of its messiness. Mm -hmm. What would you have said to him? Well, I, I would certainly say that we, we better start dealing with the gray yeah. because what we've historically done is uh, done the, uh, the black and white where we just say, mm -hmm. just do it. And we don't live in a just do it society anymore. Or and, just don't do it as I was Or talking. just don't do it. Yes, yeah. that, that's it. And so... Uh, we need to have some real open and candid discussions and we need to agree to disagree. And, um, but we need to stop uh, incarcerating, spiritually incarcerating people. Mm -hmm. um, it's not our job to judge, it's, it's, it's our job to love. And so, uh, you know, I hear a lot of people say, well, you uh, hate the, sin and love and love the sinner. Um, 
I don't believe God didn't tell you to do that. God didn't tell you to do anything that is judgmental. Well, that also that's not would, the Bible. That's not in the Bible. That's actually uh, Gandhi said that, which means it wasn't Christian. It was actually a pagan concept. <laughs> Nobody wants to hear a pagan concept, right? Pagan no. is very positive to me. Yeah. Yes. Yes. And, and so I think that the the issue is dialogue that we better start having dialogue and right. we better start being open. Uh, one of and the reasons better, I, I'm sorry, go ahead. It, it, and it's not, and dialogue is a two-way street. It's not a monologue. Right. So it is listening and talking. Right. I brought that up because KJLH, which is a, a major black radio station in Los Angeles, had me to come and speak about human sexuality. And we had a call in and a woman called in and said, um, hate the sin and love the sinner. And I said, well, that's not in the Bible. She said, yes, it is. I said, okay, go look it up and call yeah. me back and tell me where it is. And of course she never called back because it's right. not there. Yeah. Yeah, find it yeah, and call you know, the, And that's part of the biblical illiteracy that we have mm -hmm. to deal with. Mm -hmm. I was listening to KGLH many times on Sunday where people would call in and be so proud about the church they went to and the pastor's name and where it was. And they, cause it was Bible quiz time and they couldn't hardly answer one, one question. Mm -hmm. And they were, they were so proud of what they thought they knew. They were all over the map. They were in the Hebrew Bible, the new Testament, someone else's religion. They just didn't know it was rather embarrassing. So we're also dealing with biblical illiteracy on a Absolutely. Large and that's what Dr. Cohn was saying on uh, the state of the black church. He said that it is spirit and mind. And so we have a tendency to, um, to talk about uh, not using the mind, that everything is the spirit. But he said that that is not what Jesus said. Jesus said, love, your, love the Lord with your mind, your soul, body, and your mind and so so you don't dismiss one you don't go to church and check your mind in at the door and if right. that's what you're doing you need to go somewhere else right do you have any final comments because that was an excellent talk and presentation and we just love love having you with our social justice preacher series we're going to have you again did you have one final comment to make Oh, I really appreciate uh, this platform. I appreciate the work of Sister Reach. I think the timing of uh, this topic is, um, it, it's necessary. And I hopefully it will begin to help us to really have some candid conversations. But finally, I wanna say again, we, we can't just, stay at the table talking. We got to get up from there because um, we can talk all day, but it's, we have to go to work. That's right. So thank you again. And we will see you in the coming months. We'll have you again. And uh, we say goodbye to everyone. And thank you for tuning in. Okay. Thank you so much. All right. Have a good weekend. You too. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.